Hello everyone, Kit here. I have another video. Today if you guys are going to be reading the Geneva Convention, I'll leave a link to this down in the description below along for email. You can email us at themongejimo.com for private consultation. Without uh, further ado, let me get right into it. Commentary of 2016, Article 2, Application of the Convention. In addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the, even if the said occupation meets with no armed residence. Although, not, although one of the powers in conflict may not be a, to be a party to the present convention, the powers who are the parties thereof shall remain bound to it in their mutual relations. They shall furthermore be bound by the convention in relation to the said power, if the latter accept and apply to the provisions thereof. Paragraph numbers have been added in for the ease of reference. 1. The concept of declared war. The concept of declared war in the Geo Conventions corresponds to the concept of war as reflected in Article 2 of the 1899 Hague Convention, as well as the preamble to the 1907 Hague Convention 3, relative to the opening of hostilities. The notion of declared war is, is more limited than that of armed conflict in Article 2, insofar as it is imbued with formalism and, subject, and subjectivity. If the, if the Geneva Conventions hinged only on the formal action formal notion of war, their application will be contingent on their formal recognition or creation of a state of war by one of the belligerents through the insurance of a declaration of war. A declaration of war which is un un unlateral in nature triggers a state of war regardless of the position and behavior of the addressees. This notion is, rela is related in Article 2 which confirms that a state of war exists even if not recognized by one of the belligerents. Under the traditional theory of declared war, the mere fact that states are engaged in armed violence is sufficient to displace the law of peace and trigger the apl applicability of humanitarian law. Therefore, declared war is, in, in its legal mean, meaning, starts a declaration of war, which is interpreted as the only expression of the state's belligerent intent. The significance of a declaration of war was specified in 2005 by the Intria Ethiopia Claims Commission, which stated that the essence of declaration of war is the explicit affirmation of the existence of a state of war between belligerents. A declaration of war should be understood as an unilateral and formal announcement issued by the constitutionally com com competent, competent authority of state setting the exact point at which war begins with a designated enemy. Declared war will therefore mark the transition from the application of the law of peace to the law of war. It will also bring about other legal consequences, such as the application of the law of, ne of neutrality, the potential distribution of diplomatic relations between belligerents, and the application of international prize law. The Geneva Conventions become automatically applicable even when a declaration of war is not followed by armed confrontations between the declaring state and its designated opponents. Indeed, the declaration of war does not need to be under, underpinned by the hostile actions against the enemy to make humanitarian law applicable. Therefore, a state which confines itself to a declaration of war but does not, but does not participate in the fighting has to apply the Geneva, the Geneva Conventions. This also highlights the complementary between the notion of declared war and the notion of armed conflict, as the latter would need to be sustained by hostile actions, humanitarian law to govern the conduct of those involved in the armed conflict within the meeting of Article 2. Since the entry into force into the G of the Geneva Conventions, states have rarely declared war. The adoption of the UN Charter in 1945 and the in institution of just and ad belitum Regime rendering wars of aggression unlawful has resulted in a significant decrease in the practice of states declaring war on one another. However, this does not necessarily mean that the notion of declared war has fallen into, fallen into desuetude. Even if, if, if academic writers have claimed that the concept of war has disappeared, the possibility for a state to issue declaration of war cannot be discarded. 
it would therefore be, per be premature to conclude the demise and the, of the concept of declared war, even if its progressive decline cannot be ignored. Maintaining the notion of declared war also serves a humanitarian purpose insofar as it makes it possible. Even if states have not yet engaged in open hostilities, for enemy nationals who find themselves in the territory of the opposing party to benefit from the protection conferred by humanitarian law, should not should they be exposed to the adverse effects of declaration of war, of its correlative bellicosity, rhetoric, and atmosphere. Such a, in such a case, states would have to treat civilians on their territories who are the nationals of the opposing state in accordance with the Fourth Convention. The application of the conventions in case of declared war would thus prove useful for protection perspective and would fit with their humanitarian objectives. In the absence of a more objective definition of the conditions triggering the application of humanitarian law, the sole reliance on the concept of declared war and its correlative subjectivity could thwart the humanitarian objectives in the Geneva Conventions. Consequently, in 1949, it felt that there was a pressing need to dispense with the subjectivity and formalism attached to the notion of declared war and to ensure that the applica applicability of humanitarian law would mainly be premised on objective and factual criteria. Against this background, the Geneva Conventions introduced the fact that induced the fact by based concept of armed conflict defined in this material rather than legal legal sense in order to supplement the notion of declared war. Through, through this semantic shift, the drafters of the Geneva, Conven Geneva Conventions moved away from the conditioning, the applicability of the Geneva Convention solely on the legal concept of war. This, ap this applicability of humanitarian law would there thenceforth be not only related to the declared, declared will of states, but would also depend on objectives and factual criteria stemming from the notion of armed conflict in introduced in Article 2, make it applicable for as soon as a state undertakes hostile military actions against another state. The concept of armed conflict. As stated above, before the 1949 Geneva Conventions, the rule that, pre that prevailed this, this the laws of war were only applicable of, if pliable if there was a legal state of war between two or more states. Article 2 overcame this rigid rule by establishing that, besides declared war, Geneva Conventions would also be applicable if a state of war was not recognized. Since 1907, experience has shown that many armed conflicts displaying other characteristics of a war may arise without being preceded by any of the formalities laid down in the 1907 Hague Convention. It falls from Article 2 that the factual existence of an armed conflict suffices for humanitarian law to apply. In addition, the notion of armed conflict under Article 2 includes the case that of occupation resulting from hostilities or declared war. Therefore, the main added value of the notion of armed conflict is the based application of the, Gene of the Geneva Conventions on objective and factual criteria. Indeed, Article 2 underlining the preeminence of the factual existence of armed conflict over the formal status of war. Therefore, the determination of the existence of an armed conflict with the meeting of Article 2 must be based solely on the prevailing acts of demonstrating the de facto existence of hostilities between the belligerents, even without a declaration of war. This view, besides being widely held by academic writers, is also reflected in recent international decisions and certain and certain military manuals. Indeed, the ICTY and the ICTR have confirmed that applic applicability of humanitarian law should be determined according to the prevailing circumstances instead of the subjective views of the parties to the conflict. For instance, the ICTY trial chamber trial chamber stated in Bavosky and Tarlevsky that the question of whether that there was an armed conflict at the relevant time is a factual determination to be made by the trial chamber upon hearing and reviewing the evidence admitted at trial. In a simple, in a similar vein, ICTR under, underlined at Ikitsku that if the application of international humanitarian law 
depended solely on the discretionary judgment of the parties to the conflict. Most, in most cases, there will be a tendency for the conflict to be minimized by the parties thereof. In this regard, one cannot discard the possibility that some states might be tempted to deny the existence of an armed conflict even if facts on the ground prove otherwise. Even if none of the parties recognize the existence of a state of war or of an armed conflict, humanitarian law would still apply provided that an armed conflict is in fact in existence. How states characterize the armed confrontation does not affect the application of the Geneva Conventions. If the situation evidences that the state concerned is effectively involved in hostile armed actions against another state, a fact that a state does not, for political and other reasons, explicitly refer to the existence of an armed conflict within the meaning of Article 2, in a particular situation does not prevent it from being legally classified as such. The UN Security Council has also, in a resolution for example, stated its own classification of a situation under humanitarian law. The, app the applicability of the Geneva Convention is independent of official pronunciation pronouncements in order to avoid cases in which states could deny the protection of the conventions. It should be noted that there is no central authority for international law to identify or classify a situation as an armed conflict. States and parties to a conflict need to determine the legal framework applicable to the conduct of their military operations. For its part, the ICRC makes an independent determination of the facts and systematically classified situations for the purpose of its work. It is a task inherent in the role that the ICRC is expected to exercise under the Geneva Conventions as set forth in the statutes of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Other actors such as the United States and regional organizations may also need it to classify situations for their work. And international and national courts and tribunals need to, need to do so for the purposes of exercising their jurisdiction. In all cases, the classification must be made in good faith, best based upon the facts that the relevant criteria under humanitarian law. Determination based on the prevailing facts should also conform to and help preserve the strict separation of just and bellow from just ad bellum. Indeed, the virtue of this distinction, the determination of the existence of an armed conflict and the related applicability of international humanitarian law depend only on the circumstances prevailing on the ground and not on whether the use of force against, against other states is permitted under the UN Charter. Whether a state uses force in accordance with its right of self-defense because it has been authorized to do so by a UN Security Council mandate or in violation of the, of the prohib prohibit prohibition of the use of force does not affect the determination of the existence of an international armed conflict. The mandate and the actual or perceived legitimacy of a state to resort to armed force are issues which fall within the province of jus and bellum and have no effect on the applicability of international humanitarian law to a specific situation involving two or more higher contracting parties. The very object and purpose of international humanitarian law to protect those who are not or no longer taking part in the hostilities among during conflict would be defeated were to the application of body of law made independent on the lawfulness of the conflict under jus ad bellum. To conclude that humanitarian law does not apply or applies differently to a belligerent that is waging in an armed conflict that it deems just or legitimate would arbitrarily deprive the victims of that conflict of the protection due, due to them. It would, op it would also open the door for parties to armed conflicts to deny their legal obligations under humanitarian law by branding enemies' use of force as lawful or by empathizing their international legitimacy. Humanitarian law ignores such distinctions and applies equally to all states involved in the conflict. The constitutional elements of the definition of armed conflict. Article 2 speaks merely of any other armed conflict which may have arise between two or more of the contrasting parties. While it defines the parties to an international armed conflict, 
It does not provide, provide a definition of armed conflict. The main purpose of introducing the notion between armed conflict in Article 2 was to provide, uh, provide an objective standard be assessed in the basis of the prevailing facts. State practice, case law, literature, ha literature, yeah, li literature have been developed. The legal con contours of the notion of armed conflict and provided insight into how Article 2 should be interpreted. interpreted. Armed conflicts in the sense of Article 2 those are which oppose high contracting parties, states, and occur when one or more states have recourse to armed force against other states, regardless of the reasons for the intensity of the confrontation. Stated that an armed conflict exists whether therefore resort to armed force between states. This definition has been adopted by other international bodies and is generally considered the con contemporary reference for any inter in interpretation of the notion of armed conflict under humanitarian law. All the foregoing shows that the notion of armed conflict on Article 2 requires a hostile resort to armed force involving two or more states. The legal status of the belligerents between two or more of the high con contracting parties. By virtue of Article 2, the 1949 Geneva Conventions apply to all cases of armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. Emphasis added. The expression high contracting parties refers to the, the states which are these instruments are in force. The situations referred in Article 2 are therefore limited to the armed conflicts opposing states. On article, under Article 2, the identity of the actors involved in the hostilities states were therefore defined in the International Charter of the Armed Conflict. In this regard, statehood remains the baseline against which the existence of an armed conflict under Article 2 will, will be measured. When dealing with the notion of armed conflict contained in Article 2, the 1958 Complementary on the Fourth Geneva Convention refers to any difference arising between two states and leading to the intervention of the members in the armed forces. Emphasis added. However, this would mean that for an armed conflict to exist in the sense of Article 2, the simultaneous involvement of at least two opposing states through their armed forces is required. That interpretation is too narrow. Such a position would in fact exclude from the scope of armed conflict the, un the unlateral use of force by one state against another. This reading of Article 2 would be at odds with the object and purpose of the G Geneva Conventions, which is to regulate any kind of use of armed force involving two or more states. An armed conflict can arise when one state un unlaterally, unlaterally uses armed force against another state even if the latter does not or cannot respond by military means. The unilateral use of un armed force proposes a plutarily plattery of actors and still reflects an armed confrontation involving two or more states, the attacking state and the states, subject to the attack, therefore satisfying the requirement of Article 2. The fact that a state resorts to armed force against other surfaces suffices to qualify the situation as an armed conflict with the within the meaning of the Geneva Conventions. In this per perspective, the declaration, establishment, and enforcement of the effective naval air blockade as an act of war may suffice to initiate an international armed conflict into to which humanitarian law would act an act of war also apply. In a similar vein, an unconsented to evasion or deployment of a state's armed forces on the territory of another state, even if, does, if, it, even if it does not meet with armed resistance, could constitute an unilateral or hostile use of armed force by one state against another, meeting the conditions for international armed conflict under Article 2. The existence of an international armed conflict proposes the involvement of the armed forces at least one of the opposing states. Indeed, armed conflict presumes the deployment of all military mean means in order to overcome the enemy or force it into submission, to eradicate the threat it represents, or to force, force it to change its course of action. When a classic means and methods of warfare, such as the deployment of troops on the enemy's territory, 
the use of our artillery or the resort uh, to jet fighters or combat heli helicopters come into play, it is uncontroversial that they amount to the armed confrontation between states and that the application of the Geneva Convention is triggered. However, one should not discard outright the possibility that armed conflict within the meeting of Article 2 may come into existence even if the armed confrontation does not involve military personnel but rather non-military state agencies that such as preliminary forces, border guards or coast guards. Any of those could not any of those could well be engaged in armed violence displaying the same characteristics as that involving states and armed forces. A naval context under inter, under international law applicable at sea, states may in certain circumstances lawfully use force against a vessel owned or operated by another state or registered therein. This may be the case, for example, when Coast Guard suspecting a violation of their state's fisheries legis legislation attempt to board such a vessel but meet with resistance. The use of force in this course of this and other types of, mar of maritime law enforcement operations is regulated by legal notions akin to those regulating in the use of force under human rights law. In principle, such measures do not constitute an international armed conflict between the states aff affiliated with the vessels. In particular, where the force is exercised against a private vessel, it cannot be excluded. However, that the use of force at sea is motivated by something other than a state's authority to enforce regular regimen applicable at sea. Depending on the circumstances, such a situation may qualify as an international armed conflict. The question of who is involved in the armed opposition between states should not signify affect the classification of the situation as an international armed conflict. When a state resorts to means and methods of warfare against another state, that situation qualifies as an international armed conflict, irrespective of the, of the organ which within that state that is resorted to such means and methods. In a similar vein, the legal status of the belligerents also raises some, some problems in relation to a state's representation. The determination of which entity is the government or of a state matters because a number of international law issues to turn on that question, in particular to the na nature of an armed conflict involving the government of that state. Indeed, answering this question may have some impact on the classification of the armed conflict at its very beginning or, or on its reclassification over time if the government changes as a result of trans transitional political process of a military victory of a non-state armed group. However, the fact that an, an, an incumbent government has been defected, defeated, has been defeated, does not in itself divest the conflict, the armed conflict of its initial international character, nor does the establishment of a puppet government by the by the victorious belligerent. It is only p the only possible way of the nature of the armed conflict could change as a result of the defeat of the former government is to ascertain a certain that the new government is effective and consents to the presence presence of or military operations of foreign forces in its territory unless however it is instituted by the occupying power under interna international law the key condition for the exercise of a government is effectiveness that its ability to exercise effectively functions usually assigned to a government within the confines of a state's territory, including the maintenance of law and order. Effectiveness is the ability to exert state functions internationally and externally, i.e., in relations with other states. The problem might also come from a divided state, where there are competing claims to be the government of a state. Such a situation is, is such, a, such a situation existed in Afghanistan in 2001, in Cote d'Ivoire in 2010-11, and in Liberia in 2011. In this regard, it does not matter that a government failed to gain recognition by the international community at large. The very fact that the said government is effective and in control of the most territories of the state concerned means that it is the de facto government and its actions have to be treated as the action of the state it represents with all the consequences this entails for determining the existence 
of an international armed conflict. Alright guys, I'm going to end off here. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. I'll leave this link in the description below. You can email us at themuzzygmail.com. And thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. And yeah. Bye.